Welcome to the November University of Arizona Science Cafe here at Borderlands. My name is Nicole Leitner. I'm a graduate student at the university in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I also facilitate the cafe at this location. And um, this is just one of four science cafe locations that we have around town. Um, all of these uh, cafes are free to the public and brought to you by the University of Arizona College of Science. Please visit our website for more information on upcoming talks and locations. Um, I just want to bring your attention to these evaluations that I've passed around the room. Um, this will give you the opportunity to provide us with feedback on the talk and also give you the opportunity to um, give us your email address so that you can receive College of Science updates. So please uh, feel free to fill one of those out and sit on your table um, at the end of the talk. So before we get to our talk, I'd like to thank Portland's owner, Mike Malozzi, who actually came to the College of Science interested in hosting a science cafe. Um, so we're really grateful um, that he was willing to take us in here. And here at Borderlands, we feature fellows of the Carson Scholarship Program. And this program is part of the UA Institute of the Environment. Um, their efforts to support graduate students who focus on environmentally related science and work to communicate this science to the public. Comes from Rachel Carson, a marine biologist who wrote the 1962 book Silent Spring, which sparked the environmental movement in the United States. This season, here at Borderlands, our theme is Aquifers to Zika Biotic and Abiotic Issues in Conservation, where we will explore over the course of four talks a wide range of environmental issues from preventing epidemics to establishing sustainable water sources, from animal conservation to predictive climate change. And tonight our speaker is Alex Irwin. Our speaker is from Lakeland, Florida, but he now lives here in Arizona, with, um, working with Melanie Holder as a fifth year PhD student in the Genetics Graduate Interdisciplinary Department. He is also currently a third year law student. In addition to working with prairie dogs, he also has a project to better understand the effects of sport hunting on mountain lions in Colorado. He graduated from Washington and Lee University in 2013 with a double major in biology and biochemistry. And when he's not in the lab or at law school, you can find him rock climbing or playing soccer. Tonight he will present a talk titled Blood, Tissue, Hides, and Bones using conservation genomics to inform the reintroduction of black-tailed prairie dogs. And after his talk, um, feel free to ask him questions. We'll have a, a short Q&A. All right, so uh, with that, I would like to present our speaker, Alex. So, two years ago today, I was sitting in the deepest basement of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., right? And I'm just sitting there surrounded by like thousands of these taxidermy animals, right? Uh, skeletons, these old green hides. Uh, the entire room just reeks of formaldehyde. <laughs> and can y'all hear me now? Am I, am I good? Okay. Yeah. Down here, not good. Here, good. Okay. Right. All right, so right, back, back to this picture, right? I'm, I'm sitting in this basement, all of these tax rooms everywhere, and for two days, I'm just sitting there cutting these tiny snippets of skin off the underside of these prairie dogs, right? So when these taxidermists put them together, uh, they do this sewing right along the middle. And so we as biologists can go in and take tiny little scissors and cut pieces out from in between those seeds. And right now you're probably wondering, like, why is this guy standing up here holding this ridiculous little thing, talking about cutting up things that belong to museums? Well, hopefully by the time I'm done with this talk, I can convince you that I'm not crazy, that conservation genetics is a really important tool to have a better understanding of wildlife and protecting them, as well as convincing you that prairie dogs are really important to you and to Arizona as a whole. So what is conservation genetics? Well, I'm a conservation geneticist. So what that means is 
this kind of merging of cute, cuddly, endangered species, right, as we have on the screen, and DNA. We use genetics to better protect and preserve wildlife. The idea is that we study the natural world and then give this information that we're learning to managers who actually go out there and manage uh, endangered and threatened populations. And genetics can do a lot for us that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, such as discovering brand new species. So I don't know if anyone saw this this week in the news, but they just discovered a brand new species of orangutan, the Tang Toro orangutan. And describing a species is incredibly important. Right? If you don't know that a species exists, it's impossible to protect it or preserve it. Um, this is one thing genetics can do for us. Something else. So we can go in now and do non-invasive sampling. I don't even have to have an animal in hand to tell you something about it and its population. I can go out in the field and collect scat or poop, if you don't know, um, and tell you information about that individual, about the population it comes from, as well as everything that it ate. So now we can go out and take water samples from rivers and oceans and soil samples. And I can tell you from that every animal that's swimming around, everything that lives there, just from the DNA floating around in the environment. Uh, forensics is something we can do, right? Your thing you see aside is not quite that exciting. But in this kind of really infamous study, this group went to different restaurants in Los Angeles and South Korea and tested the sushi. And what they found was that a lot of the sashimi being served was actually endangered whale, right? No one wants to eat whale in their sushi. The restaurant serving it had no idea. Um, this is all just one more tool we can do with genetics, right? So we can look into the past. So we can do these ancient samples. So this picture here is a buffalo tooth that's a couple of hundred years old. So in our lab, we're extracting DNA from it to then inform um, both this team of anthropologists and biologists about whether or not buffalo were actually native to Arizona or whether they were brought here by the Native Americans. Sometimes we get even weirder stuff. So points to if anyone actually knows what this is on this picture. But it, this thawed out of the permafrost in Alaska, and scientists found it and thought it was woolly mammoth time. So they took a clip and sent it to our lab. We extracted DNA, tested it, and in fact, it wasn't mammoth. Instead, this was 10,000 year old bowhead whale that had been just thawed out of the permafrost. So this we can do incredible things. And the future looks even better, right? We're just now being able to do some of these science fiction concepts that we couldn't even believe before, right? Cloning, genetic engineering, it's all coming, it's all coming to wildlife. So this picture on the upper left is the gastric brooding frog. So this is a frog, it lays its eggs, then it swallows them and gives birth live through the mouth. It went extinct in the 1980s, and in the last couple of years, a team of scientists in Australia actually cloned it back into existence. Equally crazy is the things we can do with genetic engineering. So New Zealand just recently started this project called Predator Free 2050. And the goal is to use um, gene editing to completely eradicate invasive species. So in New Zealand, they have a lot of issues with invasive predators, like this stoat feature here. For anyone who doesn't know, a stoat is basically a weasel, right? But the biggest issue is they eat all of the native bird species. Um, so in New Zealand, they're doing these trials to use genetic engineering to completely cull these invasive populations and remove them from the island. So while we can do all these kind of pie-in-the-sky things, right, uh, more commonly what our lab does and what I do is look at the population level. We want to understand species on uh, individuals at population level. So we look to are these individuals interacting, how they're interacting within their population, how they're interacting between populations, and then what the actual populations are. We can tell how many individuals are in each population, we look to explore family relationships, so we want to determine things like which individuals breeding with each other. We want to look at uh, inbreeding. We want to look at uh, whether or not there's sexual selection, and um, occasionally we can even create family trees or pedigrees. So one of the big things I study in, the, in our lab studies is are there barriers to gene flow? So. A barrier to gene flow is something, could be some physical barrier in the environment that's keeping animals from crossing and then breeding once they cross. So things like rivers or mountain ranges or just like large stretches of inhospitable habitat can all be barriers to gene flow. 
However, a lot of times these barriers are man-made, right? So roads and highways can be especially difficult for animals to cross. Um, something like a border wall being put on the U.S.-Mexico border can keep things like jaguars or ocelots from actually crossing across. And you can tell all this from genetics. So something we've recently been able to do for the first time in history is look at adaptive variation, right? So what we want to do is, we say here in this picture, we have these two different prairie dogs, right? One of them prefers the dark grass, the other prefers the light grass. And for the first time in history, we're really able to go in and look at whether or not these differences are at the genetic level. We can see, are there genes that make them better selected for, or that make them better adapted, excuse me, for each of these different types of grass. So these last two things, looking at barriers to gene flow and adaptive variation, is something I'm really interested in and something we're going to be talking about in a second with this project. So now that I've kind of introduced to you what conservation genetics is um, and all the ridiculously cool things we can do with it, now I'm hoping I can make you care equally about prairie dogs. Right? I've been using all these cute little clip arts and I have this prairie dog here, but why should you care? Right? So there are five species of prairie dogs, but I'm going to be specifically talking about black-tailed prairie dogs. Right? Sonomus ludovicius. So when Lewis and Clark first discovered the black-tailed prairie dog, right, there were millions of them all over the Great Plains. It was probably the most widespread and most popular species in North America. Um, in 1900, it was estimated there were 100 million hectares of prairie dog colony. Uh, recent estimates I've seen put the total prairie dog colony at about 200,000 hectares. There's been something like a 98% reduction in prairie dogs, right? Uh, kind of the most striking statistic is today, all of the prairie dog habitat for black prairie dogs combined is less than 5% of what used to be the largest colony in Texas. Um, so despite all of this kind of uh, really declining population, they do still persist across almost all parts of the range, just in isolated pockets. The exception to that was Arizona. In, 19, in the 1960s, black-tailed prairie dogs were extirpated from Arizona. So extirpation just means that they've become locally extinct. We no longer have black-tailed prairie dogs in Arizona. So why is this? Why have we seen these just ridiculous decreases in prairie dog populations? Well, you know, as America kind of manifested her destiny, moved westward, uh, was having conflict with people and wildlife all over the place, concerns about the cattle and the prairie dogs competing for the same grass, right? Uh, another thing is prairie dogs do often are host for play. A lot of people know this and it's kind of, it's been known for a long time. And so a lot of people feared prairie dog colonies and wanted to eradicate them for those reasons. Um, it's not necessarily well founded. So in America, there's been 12 deaths since 2000 on plague. And of those, there's only an average of seven cases of plague a year. And of all of these cases, only 8% can actually be tied back to prairie dogs. You are much more likely to get plague from your cat or dog, and act a flea on a cat or dog, than you are from a prairie dog colony. Um, but despite that, this kind of image of prairie dogs being a pest and being a garment has really stuck. And state and federal agencies um, went almost out of their way to poison the colonies and dynamite the colonies and remove prairie dogs from the landscape. Um, it's, in, one, in some of these Midwestern states, it's actually a law that if you have prairie dogs on your land and they spread to your neighbor's land, you can call an exterminator to remove them from both sides and bill your neighbor for the bill. So despite all this negative press, prairie dogs really are vital for the grassland ecosystems they live in. Prairie dogs are what we call in ecology a keystone species. So ecologists, we aren't always uh, the most inventive with our terms. We stole this from architecture. So a keystone is the central piece of an arch, right? It's that top piece. If you take the keystone out, the arch just collapses. And the same thing can be said of these grassland ecosystems without prairie dogs. So as a keystone species, prairie dogs exert just a wide range of effects all throughout the environment, right? So 
in their abandoned burrows, you get badgers and um, you know burrowing owls, snakes, mm -hmm. black-footed ferrets, all live in these abandoned burrows. Um, prairie dogs are food for coyotes and hawks, and of course, the critically endangered black-footed ferret, which almost exclusively relies on prairie dogs for its dinner. Um, what's really cool is how prairie dogs actually um, modify their environment. Sort of like how beavers will chop down trees and build dams, prairie dogs work to keep the grasslands short. They convert these high and medium grasslands to these short, open grasslands. And that might not seem at first like a special thing, but what it does is it actually increases the forage quality for a lot of other species. So things like buffalo and pronghorn, and they've even shown in a couple of studies that cattle actually preferentially prefer to eat on prairie dog colonies. That's better for them than off colonies. Um, maybe the most critical thing is that they've shown time and time again that biodiversity or the number of species present is much higher on prairie dog colonies than off prairie dog colonies. So they really are um, really great for the grasslands. So with all of these benefits in mind, in 2008, Arizona Game and Fish Department began this effort to reintroduce black-tailed prairie dogs back into the space. So they did this, they introduced them down in Los Angeles National Conservation Area. I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It's about an hour south of town, outside of Sonoya. It's just rolling grasslands, there's pronghorn, prairie dogs. Um, I would highly recommend it. So Arizona Game of Fish originally established three colonies. They took these prairie dogs from New Mexico and from Sonora, Mexico. Um, and while the reintroductions have been so far successful and the populations are growing, they really do need more prairie dogs if they're gonna make this a long-term success, if these colonies are gonna start expanding on their own and spread throughout the rest of the state. Um, and that's difficult for a number of reasons. So all of the colonies that they brought prairie dogs from um, have now had pretty significant declines um, because of drought or plague or some other unknown reasons these populations have crashed. Um, so with that in mind, we set out to find Arizona Game of Fish, another source population for their reintroductions. And at first blush, this sounds like it should be really quite easy. There are still lots of prairie dogs throughout the Midwest. Um, the prairie dogs in the Southwest as a whole have declined, but in the Midwest, there's, there's still a lot. They're being treated like vermin. Um, but there's kind of this complication. So based on morphology, it's believed that prairie dogs in the Midwest are different from prairie dogs in the Southwest. Um, this morphology is almost entirely based on skull measurements. Um, and generally, traditionally, so this blue line is supposed to be the Pecos River. The Pecos River has been believed to be the dividing line between these two different groups of prairie dogs. And so while it might just seem asinine that we're talking about not wanting to move uh, prairie dogs from the Midwest to the Southwest and mix them because of skull sizes, often um, these differences in morphology are indicative of more underlying changes. So there could be real adaptive differences between these, right? So the prairie dogs in the Midwest might not be suited to be moved to the Arizona grasslands and vice versa. Um, alternatively, they could have been separated for so long evolutionarily that bringing them back together would have negative fitness effects and the reintroduction might be completely jeopardized. Um, so with that in mind, we set out to find Arizona Game and Fish, an additional source population. We had three objectives to this project. So first, we wanted to determine um, the genetic makeup of prairie dogs that used to live in Arizona before they were extirpated. Secondly, we wanted to determine if there were any physical barriers to gene flow. This is what I was talking about earlier, specifically about the Pecos River. But who knows, we might have found something else. And third, we really want to determine if there are genetic differences um, based on some sort of environmental differences. So we're talking again about adaptive variation. So with that in mind, we set out to actually go and collect our samples. So this is a map of all of the samples we've collected. The blue dots are live samples, and the red dots are samples that we got from museums. Um, we ended up with about 500 samples. Some of these dots are indicative of more than one. Um, and we have samples pretty much covering the entire range, from Sonora and Chihuahua, um, through Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all the way up through Montana. So, you know, while I'm normally stuck uh, in the lab or in a class at the law school, occasionally I get to actually get out and get my hands dirty uh, and do field work, which is fantastic. I love field work. So we've done a couple of trapping expeditions. Um, and when you trap prairie dogs, you go out there with these tomahawk traps. So that's what's pictured here. It's kind of a mesh trap. It's got a trellis in the middle, 
and a gate on the end. The prairie dog comes in, steps on the trellis, and pop, it shut in. Um, we bait these things with peanut butter and uh, like sunflower seeds. Uh, it's crazy how much they love peanut butter. We had this one prairie dog, we called him Big Mac. I've never seen another prairie dog this fat. And you catch him literally every single time you go out and check the traps. Um, you know you caught them before because after you catch them and you take uh, your blood sample, you're going to paint a little symbol on their rump so you know what they are. So his was BM for Big Mac. Um, and we literally just caught this prairie dog like four or five times a day. Um, but hopefully you will catch new prairie dogs. And when you catch a new prairie dog, you go out there and you throw a sheet down on top of the cage. It's the first thing you want to do. As you're walking up, they're kind of wary of you. They don't like things that are above them. They think you're a predator. They're just going to kind of chatter away at you. But once you put the sheet down, they instantly go quiet. Uh, it's like back in the dark. They're happy. They, they don't care. You can pick up the cage, move them around. No worries. So you take the cage, and you walk back to your field station. right? And at the field station, you're going to uh, take measurements, uh, paint your symbol on the rump, and then take a blood sample. So depending on who we had working with us, sometimes we took blood from the femoral artery through an IV, as is pictured here. Other times what we do is you clip the toenail with toenail clippers. So because prairie dogs are this such strong burrowers, they have these vascular toenails. So all you have to do is a little clip with toenails, with like toenail clippers, and you can kind of milk the toe into your vial. And you only need about a milliliter of blood. It's really not a lot. Um, you can kind of liken this to being a finger prick at the doctors. Um, afterwards, you put some anticoagulant on there to stop the bleeding and put them back in their cage. And once they're back in their cage, we can release them back out into the burrow they came from. Um, and once you open the cage, they make these hilarious noises. They're just like squeaking away, warning all of their friends, running back down their hole. <laughs> so while live sampling is great, sometimes we also need museum samples. So the only way you can answer questions about what prairie dogs in Arizona looked like 100 years ago is to get DNA from prairie dogs that lived in Arizona 100 years ago. And so, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I was fortunate enough to travel to Washington, D.C. and sample at the Smithsonian Museum, as well as getting some samples from the um, UA Mammal Collection here in Tucson. So kindly lend me this one today. Um, so when you're in the museum, you are literally, as I was pointing to earlier, looking for the seams in the taxidermy where you can cut just tiny little slivers. Uh, the idea is to leave the sample in as pristine condition as you found it. But sometimes there aren't hides. Sometimes we have to use bone. And when you go to a museum and ask for bone samples, they're going to hand you a skull in a box. And hopefully there's little pieces that have already broken off down at the bottom. That's great. You can take those. It doesn't have any effect on the morphological value of the skull. Other times when you get really pristine skulls, like this one here, you can't do that. So instead what you're going to do is take a pair of tweezers and go right up the nasal cavity and pull out these tiny flakes from the nasal turbinates. And what you end up with is a tiny bag about this big of tiny little flakes. But you really don't need a lot of bone to get good DNA. So once we've got all our samples, right, we've got our bone, we've got our tissue, we've got our uh, hive, we've got our blood, we go back to the lab whether we're you know, working with uh, fresh prairie dog blood or 10,000 year old mammoth, either way, the first thing you're gonna do is extract DNA. So for anyone who doesn't really remember their high school biology class, here's a kind of a quick, brief introduction. Uh, DNA is made up of bases and is in a double helix, right? Everyone knows that. Um, for the sake of this talk, when you hear DNA, when you hear genetics, I want you to think of just letters in a line. Right? I want you to think of either A's or T's or G's or C's in a line. So once we extract DNA, right, we just have this huge long string of letters, theoretically. Um, and the genome is really, really big, right? So in each one of us, in the human genome, there are over 3 billion of these letters in every copy of your genome. And though sequencing has gotten a lot cheaper since the original human genome was sequenced for billions of dollars, um, it's still not quite cheap enough for us to do that for every sample. So what we do instead is chop up our DNA so we're only picking the pieces we actually are interested in. And so we're going to do this with restriction enzymes. These just work like scissors and chop the DNA up into pieces of about equivalent size that we can then work with. So right, so now we've got our chopped up DNA. It's in this little liquid vial. 
we send it through a sequencing machine and it spits out a string, a string of letters on a computer, right? It's really simple. Well, in fact, it's not that simple. What you get in reality